First, we want to introduce ourselves a little bit. Um, <clears throat> my name is Quinton Aldridge, or I go by Q. Um, I do that for both the Star Trek and the James Bond connotations. Um, <clears throat> I'm a certified LabVIEW architect, a LabVIEW champion. Um, right now I am the ta task architect, and we're going to be able to show you task a little bit today. And, and I'm a big Harry Potter fanatic, and uh, that's me dressed up as Arthur Weasley there. So, Awesome. Uh, Kevin Shirey, although sometimes a little bit reverby, but... We'll try to make that better. At least it's not humming now. So we've been doing a lot of the technical side, trying to make it better for y'all. Um, Kevin Shirey, K-Dub, I do a lot of like weird out, like recording stuff, making LabVIEW songs and stuff, doing the video and having a great time with that. Used to do a lot of karaoke and theater. Uh, also LabVIEW champion recently, a couple years ago. Uh, been a CLA now for seven years. Um, played the role of Shrek. Got to play him, it was quite fun, but you know, a house much like an onion, it's got lots of layers. <laughs> <laughs> so first off, we want to ask, how many people here know what a HAL is? Okay, good, most people. So we probably don't need to go over what is a HAL, you know, it is definitely not a rogue AI that takes over a spaceship. Um, it is actually a way to make it really easy to swap in and out hardware and to basically battle obsolescence. Um, so, so one thing we want to ask is why have a HAL? And just like I said, you know, to, to battle obsolescence, um, paralyzed development, you know, all, all of these things that those that know what a HAL is, let me ask one more question. How many actually use a HAL in their frameworks? Good, all right. So you, you're all convinced of this already. And just like we thought, uh, we did this presentation actually at NI Connect, and we wanted to do this a little bit different. So let's go to the summary. So here's our whole presentation. So there it is for you. That's all you need to know. Um, no, what we're going to do instead of just rehashing the same presentation is we want to make this a panel discussion. So we're, instead of just having four or five people on the stage, we're a panel of about 100 people. And we're going to, we have, when we did this presentation, we had, uh, I acted as the novice and Kevin acted as the expert, which is not too far off of the truth um, as far as hows go. And so... We are going to have, I'm sure we have novices and experts in the audience. And so we might not cover all of our slides and we don't care. We want to make this an open discussion. So there is going to be someone running around with a mic. Make sure to wait for a mic. But we want to basically just ad lib this and, and make, it a, make it a discussion. So, <clears throat> so first question I'm going to ask is what's some of the problems that you run into with in your HAL development. I guess we can just. Well, I just say the biggest problem is that different devices that fill the same function still might have different capabilities. So one might be more capable and one might be less capable. And when you try to plug that into a HAL, some, it's hard to know what it can do or how to interact with it. Awesome, exactly. That was one of the things that we brought up in our presentation at NI Connect is you have a device that can do multiple functions or it has a lot more coverage. Um, we talk about this. Uh, do you want to do the most coverage or the least coverage or how are you going to overlap those Venn diagrams? And one thing at Test Rack that we strive to do is do the most coverage but you don't necessarily do it all at once because that costs a lot. Um, you do it as the customer needs it and fill it out. <clears throat> What's some of the ways that you've handled it? Uh, moo, hey. Uh, I like to start out with uh, features that we know we're gonna need right away um, because you may not ever use all the features of a given device or type of device. And so we'll, we'll, we'll start with that and then we'll fill it out because it's, if you write the abstraction layer in a good way that you can maintain, it's not hard to add more functionality as you need it. Exactly, and that's what, that's what we do too, is, is start off with the, the functionality we need. And then in your API, you do have to end up growing the API layer. 
And, and what that ends up doing is you might have some models where a function is a no-op or some other because it is a model that doesn't have that feature, whereas another model does. Yeah. What, what other problems do you run into? So I would uh, estimate that one of the ones that tends to cause a breakdown is two different devices that have a different uh, effective state model. They need to be called in different ways and most abstraction layers are do this, do this, do this, do this and you write a program based on the abstraction and everything works great as long as all the instruments that are all the things, let's just call it, can operate in that very specific sequence of orders. And it's not uncommon to run into two different instruments from two different vendors that one eats the pillow if you call these two functions in a reverse order. And so it causes a lot of necrosis to happen underneath the hood just to make the abstraction work because everything's trying to get fit into that singular layer. So anybody else had that same problem? How, did, how have you tackled it before? <laughs> Do you want to go? Go for it, Brian. I'm curious what you have to say. Um, one of the things that's going through my head is that Ivy has addressed a lot of these issues because it's essentially a hardware abstraction layer. In the case of Norm's case, it's the API as defined by the Ivy Foundation is intended to hide those differences in state model. It uses state caching to do that. And if you, you know, say, I set the mode on a DMM and it automatically resets digits of precision to some default that's different from what I had already configured, that's a, you know, kind of one of the prime cases, then the driver is supposed to do the right thing of like you set five and a half digits precision and then you set frequency, it should reset five and a half digits when you set frequency because it knows that that's a different, you know, wrong part of the state model. And so that's one way that it's already addressed. And I would, you know, on that earlier question, I would say I would shrink in that most Venn diagram so that the edges are cut off and like most features, but not all features of model A and B. And that's also what the Ivy Foundation did with that, where they have escape patches. If you want to use something that's unique to an instrument, but you know you're no longer doing something interchangeable at that point. Mm -hmm. So I like that. You're saying that sometimes when things are called out of order like that, you kind of have to do that under the hood. So you know that, for example, you use the, the example of, of the digits. If it resets it when you reset the frequency, then you automatically know that you have to set it again. And you do that under the hood so that it's uh, abstracted away. <clears throat> We also had this, I like this analogy of, of Wally where he tries to decide where the fork and the spoon goes, you know, and he has a spork. And so he's like, where does it go? That's another problem that you run into a lot is you have a device that can do multiple things, you know. If you, if you have an object-oriented hierarchy, um, and normally the device would just fit under one area, but now this could fit under two different areas. How do you handle that? Interfaces, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, that's a, that's a good way to go. We would like to be able to handle that at Testeract, but we're not able to go to, to Labview 2020 yet just because our customers are mostly DOD. So they're, we're on Labview 2019. What's other ways to handle it? You, uh, Alan had his hand up. It's just the one you've listed there, you know, I. I the device's representation in software is it's an entirely separate thing. So we did two, if it's, if the device does two things, we have, we have two plugins for it. One for, you know, personality A and one for personality B and we just use them in a completely different way. There's, it's, it's just another, it's two different layers on top of the same uh, device API is all. Yeah, that's what we chose to do at Testeract. We implemented essentially two different devices in the hierarchy. Um, there might be instances where they can act like two completely separate devices. There might be instances where they have to share a connection, so they have to know how to, to talk to each other, it's kind of, to be able to share that connection. Uh, I've solved that problem with a decorator pattern in OOP where I have an abstract I have a device and then I have a decorator that I add depending on the function I need. 
Oh yeah, that, that would be a good way. It's, it's similar to the interface idea um, where but they both can have components that they use. Um, what, other, what other aspects that we, oh yeah, Th this one's one that we talked about that kind of fits along the same line is, is you have a device that actually can be talked to two, through two channels or something like that, almost like they're completely separate devices even though they're one physical device, you know, how, how do you choose to handle that one? Maybe, maybe you're all just thinking that you handle it this way. I don't know. Norm? Well, it, I think to, before getting to that individual, like how do you handle that scenario? I think it's a matter of uh, decomposing the capabilities of an individual module because like a scope, sometimes they're totally okay being treated as independent and sometimes they're not like a, a DSA card a dynamic for like for doing audio analysis, right? All channels need to be at the same multiple of a frequency. Otherwise it goes cray cray, right? Uh, and so I think that's one of those scenarios of, uh, it, in, in terms of how to solve something like that, I think to this question and to other ones as well, uh, possibly allowing for the layer that you're um, letting your API not just be simple static atomic calls and allowing the thing that you're calling to be an effective engine running underneath the hood. Because a lot of things can be solved by not just going, hey, there's a there's a, a user request, a command, a VI and a Skippy command and it's it done and it's there, as opposed to saying, hey, there's a small engine facilitating this device. And then that can have some active intelligence to not only hold, hey, what state am I in, um, or, or what mode is being asked of me, it can do that smarter intelligence as opposed to just being, I guess, like I said, calling it as a, a static implementation. Uh, so that I would say of, hey, if you're gonna solve that, then the individual implementation has the authority to take those incoming requests and field them out as appropriate for its way of dealing. That makes sense. And and I guess this would be specific to the application that you're going to use it for. I know that we have instances in test tracks how where we do it like this, where they basically um, are two implementations of the same device, um, where we can treat them basically separate. But like Norm said, if there's a reason where the data has to be interdependent um, or timed together or things like that, there might be reasons to implement it. Uh, as one smarter unit. Yep. So what other question do you want to cover? What do you think? What are the problems have you run into that you're, you're really worried about? Who? Did you raise your hand? Okay. The witness portion of it. You know that um, you are running lab use 32 bits test and 32 bits and then you, uh, everything is working fine. Uh, it works really good, like how it works, but suddenly one of those devices requires a 64-bit DLL. And now how you have to migrate just because one of the devices is not able to withstand the 64-bit version. And yeah, the, mostly comes from wanting to run with additional RAM, um, longer tests, you know. Mm -hmm. that, that's pretty much my question, how can you handle the business portion yeah. of it? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a hard question to, to answer is you have mixed 32-bit and 64-bit. For example, you have a device that's 32-bit, it's now obsolete. You go to buy a replacement and you can only get 64-bit. Well, does that force you then to upgrade your whole application to 64-bit or not? Um, I can talk about the way we solved it, but I want to ask who's, who's had to deal with this and who saw it, how, how have you solved it before I talk about how we try to solve it. I was gonna say one way you could handle this is to write the 32-bit component and compile it or somehow have it running as a separate executable and then have some sort of messaging between the two various, you know, like the 64-bit stuff and the 32-bit stuff. Yeah, exactly. And, and then you sort of separate it out that way. But. That's kind of how we tackled it. And, and we're actually looking into the new gRPC stuff as well as a way to, to separate that. But it almost, almost ends up being that it's two separate servers running. And then you're, you're talking to them through some common protocol, uh, TCP, you know, use uh, gRPC, use JSON. He wants 
So one of the main problems I'm facing is uh, I, I want to be able to hide code that has that nobody has to mess with. So uh, for that, I use PPLs. So the problem now comes, yes, I did my 32-bit PPL, my 64-bit PPL. So what I normally did is those PPLs just have a, there's the same source code. It's just a different conditional disable symbols that I just compile them 32-bit, 64-bit. But then I have to make a wrapper with another conditional disable symbol that, that loads one PPL or the other. And that it is still source code. People can still have access to it and break something. So I'm wondering how would you handle bitness using a, a PPL. So he said how, he, he's, he's written his source code in such a way where it has conditionals to tell whether it's 32-bit versus 64-bit so that the source code's the same. But then obviously we've run into this. When you build the PPL, you have to build the PPL as 32-bit or as 64-bit and then they don't, you can't cross use those um, across the bitnesses. So, um, we use PPLs extensively in our framework. And the way that we would handle this is very similar to what the other gentleman said was, we would have to have some other server running as the 32-bit server that's running the 32-bit PPL, you know, that's running the 32-bit driver, and then have some kind of messaging that we would then use to, to drive that. Yep. So, does that make sense? And, and there's some ways to make that kind of hidden under the hood. I mean, even though it's a separate server, you can, you can still do a TCP communication local host or something like that. Um, there's other ways to, to do that communication. So, awesome. Any other questions on that? Go to another question or? Norm, go for it. Sorry. Um, I'm, I'm very grateful that you said kind of a remote server per device and this idea of, you know, it, it's the, uh, the minute that you allow yourself to say, I'm going to make the new thing for this entity, you've now created a safe, that safe boundary. And I'm curious as to anybody who's made these abstractions before has gone the route of really trying to make uh, individual kind of uh, I guess programs, if you will, kind of standalone programs to help represent the thing that you're connecting to, because then it's in your control, right? It's, and then it also very similar to the test panels for like a DQMH module, that idea of, hey, I have an interface to this thing that is now mine that I can control, not only from a user interface, but also a programmatic interface. Uh, and then all of a sudden you're free of a lot of different boundaries. You can communicate to it through, you know, uh, uh, you know, through TCP or whatever else it is, but has anybody else gone the way of kind of hyper modularization of the abstraction nuggets, right? Underneath the hood, it seems like the right way to go. Do you see nobody in the back? That's okay, but yeah, just to have gone that route. Has anyone tried to do that? There's, <laughs> Darren's raising his hand. Uh, no, no, so, I should throw the microphone. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't do it. <laughs> Who was? a oh, Willis, okay. So that's actually exactly how our internal architecture work is, works is essentially every single um, concept, right? Whether or not it's a logger or data acquisition or instrument, um, it has its own dedicated process, right? And so that allows you to control all the available messaging that it manages as well as all the logic. So, you know, talking about instrumentation, you know, if we talk about like an NI scope versus any real Skippy scope, right? You're streaming data versus you're just asking for acquisitions. You need different logic in the back end in order to manage that. And so by going this kind of extreme modular route, you can have in um, completely independent modules with their own interfaces that can have their own test VIs that can be put in or taken out without affecting the rest of the code. And then we kind of take it a step further using a subscription model so that um, rather than sending messages directly ex except in specific situations, um, you can simply subscribe to particular um, events or information and again, they're no longer directly connected so say, you know, I'm running a test sequence and I'm generating test results. I have a report, but now I need a second report or now I want to add a database. Well, I just write a database module that subscribes to test results and boom, now I'm saving test results without changing any of the rest of my code. It can be developed completely independently. Um, so that works really well. Do you take it all the way to executable level for those things? 
Um, yeah, I mean, those all build into executables. You kind of have a specific launcher that has some basic infrastructure, which is kind of the secret sauce of how it works. Um, and then um, besides launching that infrastructure, then you just launch whatever module you need and it builds very easily. Yeah, one thing that we've added on to that on our framework is all of that is configuration file driven. Um, <clears throat> so as far as what you want to launch, it's really just editing the config file and then you don't have to have really anything like that hard coded, um, but it, it, it makes it, like you said, the hyper modulization, I like that. All right, did we, did we finish off that question? Do we, we have another question we wanna cover. Anything burning you up? <laughs> Norm wants to talk again. Yeah, somebody stop me. <laughs> Or don't. That's okay. Norm has a lot of experience with Hal, so he's got a presentation that I remember giving. One of the first CLA summits I went to, he gave a presentation called Halitosis. Yeah, I so love it. Stop writing hardware abstraction layers that stink. Yes. Yep. That was awesome. Um, the, re the reason that I wanted to, to bring this up, because it is a, the, the, the premise of in that presentation, one of the things that really spurred it on was it was a room full of people like this said, who's got a hardware abstraction layer at their organization? 98% of the hands went up. And then basically, who likes their hardware abstraction layer? And about four went up, right? And it's <laughs> this, and I, the, quest, the question being is there's a twofold. One, uh, what do you think causes that uh, disdain and the want to rewrite stuff? And why do you think you, this implementation that y'all are going after ends up being different? And maybe start from that standpoint of uh, facilitating um, somebody on ramping that used to have access to an instrument driver that is now either needing to go through your layers or prevented from getting down to where the actual, what's the thing that actually caused the problem because they used to be able to see it. And now there's, you know, layers of the onion that they want to go through, but now it's shelled off. And I think that to me, I think that was probably a really big reason why, because if a how works great, then people are cool, right? But what happens, what's the thing that goes wrong? Well, people feel like they're beholden to debug all the way down. So do you think that that's the reason that most hands stayed down? And what do you think y'all are doing different? Well, maybe we'll let, let it, that open up, but yeah. unless okay. you wanna. Yeah, so, so those that like their hardware abstraction leader, what do you think you're doing different? This feels like Fireside chat with Norm and Brian. <laughs> you know, maybe a fireplace next to your Sam up there and just put Norm and me up there. Um, so, f so first of all, well, you know, I, I mentioned that, you know, this is a lot of these problems have already been solved. And so I happen to know that they've already been solved. So that gives me a leg up. You know, because the Ivy Foundation's put a lot of thought into it. But you also have to keep in mind, like, the, the first hardware abstraction layer was NI48.2, and then they built Visa on top of that, and that was the, you know, hardware abstraction layer to end all hardware abstraction layers. Um, or I guess VXI plug and play was in there. And then, uh, you know, Ivy was built on top as the hardware abstraction layer to some end all hardware abstraction layers. And then, of course, we build our own. That because we don't always use Ivy, um, and so, but I think that that having seen how other people have solved this and and doing that is a big help. So the 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 other thing, uh, I, the way I see people fail, you know, I, one of the things that you know, we've heard me talk before about how a, an instance of an abstraction, like when you're trying to figure out what your abstraction is, the first version of it with one instrument is not an abstraction because it just means you can abstract one instrument. Once you add the second instrument, now you can start to build an abstraction and it, you're getting a more informed way of building it. Right? And then when you add the third instrument, you're even more informed about what that abstraction should be. And so one, being flexible enough when you build the first one for it to change and you know don't overcommit to what that abstraction is until you've proven that it works uh, you know, two or three different ways. The other, you know, approach that I like to take is, you know, I would call it kind of a me measurement abstraction layers coming from the top down of how do I want to use this instrument? And then do I want a measurement abstraction layer? Do I want a hardware abstraction layer? And if I want to how, do, what do I want it to look like to be easy to use? It doesn't have to be the way the instrument 
presents itself, it can be how I want to use it. And so both of those are very effective ways of coming up with a better API that you're happier with. I don't know if that makes sense. So one of the things that that uh, that we have in our HAL, and I don't know if this dir this directly answers the question, but this is one of the things that I think makes TestRex HAL very powerful, is um, the ability to test every function. Um, you're able to we have we have panels that are already created for you that you can exercise to test every function and and that makes it a lot simpler for someone to adopt um, I guess and uh, I guess if if they if they can adopt it and they can see that it's working then they don't feel like they have to go down in the deeper layers um, I would say you know, I wanted to also bring up about how do you create that abstraction because it's hard to support that layer that is abstracted with other things down the road. So you can't just take a function and add an extra input to it unless it's default. You've now destroyed other existing frameworks, right? If you're trying to lean in a test stand, well, now that means you now have to completely recompile that. So at design time, when you're at the abstraction layer, we try to think of different devices, inexpensive, most common. Wow, that's great, right? And you want to Think of those three different instruments. You may not have them, but you want to create that abstraction based on those three. Because one might have multiple channels, one might have one. It might be completely different on how you want to interact and build that layer. So it's important to think ahead before you want to support it. Awesome. Does that finish that question? Do we have something else to add? Um, Anybody? I, I did want to add a few other things to Go for it. Um, just the organization of it. Um, Another idea is that you don't want to just create the abstraction and have direct links. Everything that we build is in, in, in a PPO, but we also wrap it in an API. And that API can be the messaging system. It's got logging. It's got simulation. It decides on which PPL is going to be used or picked. You can design that API however you want. And that's where you can get that messaging and notification, subscription, logging. There's a lot of different areas um, that help support that from injection. So yeah, one of the things that we have is, is there's a lot of pl places that you can plug in um, and, and have these other aspects actually go to the next slide. Yeah, we have, uh, you know, we, we have the, a manager that shares connections. We have a logger. We handle the communications. All of that stuff is kind of abstracted as well so that you inherit or you get all of that when you create a new device or a new model and add a new model. Um, all of that comes along for free, basically. And so that's one of the reasons why when I brought up that debug panel that we have, um, that's one of the things that makes this work is, is when you create a new device, it automatically has those plugins as part of the top, as part of the higher le API level. So how are we doing on time? Got another 10, 20 minutes. 10, 20 minutes. Okay. Other questions? Uh, there's several back there, so. <laughs> uh, how do you handle the UUT communication in your house? So one of the things that we do is handle it as just another device. Um, how does other people handle their UUTs? Same way. <laughs> Same way? Any, any, anything different? So one of the things that we talked about is, is, yeah, you could handle a UUT as the overall test system, you know, like it's at the application level, really, rather than in your HAL. But if you have your UUT in your HAL, then like I said about any model being able to inherit logging and the communication and all of that other stuff built in, if your UUT is also in your HAL, then you inherit all of those functionalities. So we're able to you know, individually exercise methods that are targeted to the UUT. We're able to log the, all of the communication or all of the uh, settings that the UUT is at. Yep. Someone else was going to comment, I think. I'd like to go back to the 32 versus 64. Um, so we're using LabVIEW 32 and it's constrained memory. Should we be switching to 64 and would we be able to use all the VIPM plugins? Um, anyone want to answer that? I don't know about all the VIPM plugins, but. Well, I guess we're. For Brian. 
has something here. We'll just leave the microphone with you. Sure, me and Norm. <laughs> Norm. As the co-inventor of LabVIEW 64-bit, um, I am a big fan of it. Uh, for the most part, um, everything works now. Uh, you know, I, you can use VP, VIPM, you know, as we touched on earlier, any DLLs have to match the bitness. But, you know, for example, ActiveX objects do not. ActiveX has a thunking layer so it can, can traverse that boundary, um, which I don't recommend anybody use ActiveX, but, you know, that's <laughs> a possible solution to your earlier thing is if you have an ActiveX interface to your, your thing, you can make it work either way. Um, so in general, you know, yes, it solves the memory problem uh, in a lot of different ways. And there's, I don't know, I, you know, there maybe is a little bit of maybe FPGA hardware that still doesn't work in 64-bit, but, Just you know, protocols. yeah, I think we're, I think we're there finally after a dozen <laughs> years. Yeah. 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 And I, I agree. We would, at Test Direct, we would like to standardize on 64-bit. We still have some customers that are, are pulling us back. Um, so we do have, we do support both a 32 bit and a 64 bit. And we do publish all of our stuff when we can as both 32 bit and 64 bit. Um, it does make it hard to maintain. And we would really like to just standardize on 64 bit going forward and do away with our whole 32 bit code base. Um, until then, though, we do have some of these things where we have spin up servers that are running by themselves that we have communication between and things like that. But ultimately, we want to be able to use, utilize that higher memory bandwidth and other things. And, and ultimately, that's going to be the standard going forward. You know, um, I don't know the timeline, but I'm sure NI has a timeline of when they would love to sunset 32 bit. A question in the back. And Eric's waving his hand. <laughs> uh, I'll add to everything Brian was just talking about. It. You you should move things to 64 bit. I won't tell you that there's a definitive timeline, but we will eventually end 32 all 32 bit app software at NI. You can't buy computers that'll run 32 bit processes forever. That'll just end. Um, a lot of the security changes, especially in DOD, will start forcing that to happen. So it won't be because of the memory. It'll be because you can design better systems on a 64-bit processor. So that'll be kind of a influencing factor. And Brian's not wrong. Um, for the last couple of years, everything we've designed, we design across platform. So anything that we design for 32-bit goes into the 64-bit versions. There are still some differences, and we will work on closing those as fast as we possibly can. Um, but I would encourage everybody to be, if you're not already evaluating that, to start evaluating moving everything into a 64-bit um, app system. Okay. Do we do we want to go to the demo now, or do you? We got five more minutes. Five more minutes. Okay. A couple more questions. I have some fo two folks up here. Um, I'm curious to hear about how other people are handling deploying their HALs and whether or not they're building all their objects within the application or using plugin architectures. And if using plugins, how do you then handle all your version management? Awesome. Good question. So, how are you deploying your HALs? Sergio wants to, to share up here. Um, I can just let you use mine. <clears throat> what I normally do is just I just make sure to deploy the HAL into the into a folder which is public for all users so that everybody can use it. And the way I, and I'm not sure if this is a horrible idea, but uh, what I do I have to work the HAL on testing, right? So if you suddenly try to use a 32-bit uh, connector and you just deploy a 64-bit PPL, then you're going to have broken code if you're calling it from a module. So what I normally do is I just uh, uh, make sure that I singleton, uh, that I just make a singleton and I call, yeah, the abstraction is just the instrument. I call it like a helper for the HAL. So it loads the 64-bit PPL or the 32-bit PPL, but I call it, I don't load the module there because it's going to be broken, right? So I just call it by name. So that's how I try to deploy it. May helpers around the HAL. <laughs> Awesome. Anyone else? 
So the way that, that we handle it at Testerac is um, very kind of similar. We have a manager that uh, obviously is created and deployed in the application as, as 32-bit or 64-bit. And then we actually have a manifest file that gets set, which is just another configuration file, that uh, its job is to say where the 64-bit HAL or the 32-bit HAL lives. And that's a specific location on disk. And then after that, the configuration file furly, further defines which PPLs get loaded. And as far as actual deployment, the way that we handle that is obviously we build, the, we build PPLs but we deploy exclusively using NIPM. And so we package all of the PPLs uh, through NIPM and then we have NIPM feeds. Um, we've also gone so far as creating some other things to help deliver to our customers. Uh, we have something called a stator. So there's a test direct stator that saves <clears throat> a snapshot of what all of the feeds should be for each customer so that we can keep track of what we've deployed for each customer. And then as far as versioning goes, um, to answer that question too, um, we keep track of the versioning through tags in, in our Git repository. And then these snapshots get saved off as specific versions that we can then deploy to our customers. And to add to that, each PPL becomes its own package so that you can add on the dependencies that it might require and just let NIPM kind of build that spec for you as much as you need. Um, yeah, with the stator, it kind of also helps to check what's actually installed. It's not just, here's a list, but we actually go do the, the checksums and the CRC so that we can validate that what we think's installed is actually installed at startup. Any other thoughts on that one? Did you get your questions answered? I don't know if you guys got to speak. You both had your hands up at one time. I don't know. I have an unrelated question. Okay, go for it. So my question's about um, logging and including that in a HAL. So historically, I've usually incorporated logging at like a functional module level or at an application level, depending on what my goals are. I could see logging in the HAL or logging at a driver level, getting kind of verbose and sort of loud. So I'm curious, philosophy is from around the room for doing that and like comparing it to using IO trace or something to extract the same sort of low level debugging information. And if, if it proves useful, once you get to full blown application development, if you're still looking at driver logs for like the power supply or something like that. Yeah, any thoughts on, on the logging side? Norm's raising his hand sheepishly. <laughs> Go for it, Norm. Uh, my presentation's tomorrow. I'll talk a little bit more on that then. But the uh, two aspects of logging, one is, yes, <laughs> you need it, right? I think anytime we've tried to all find something and it's like, there's oh, the data already exists somewhere. It just, you don't have to go diving for it. It's, you know, you get that insight, your in, insights and accelerators were the things that people were trying to remember earlier uh, about debugging. But uh, the idea of how do you deal with the deluge of um, information, that's that accelerators is, hey, if you're making a log, uh, have something to better digest and filter through, right? IO trace is something that um, I've been itching badly uh, to have tools built on top of those logs, right? Because there's so much information, like what happened, what was it, where is it? And in the name of a sequence diagram of a, that is a beautiful visualization of what happened when with which information. And so if you're making logs, not only is it worthwhile to uh, add the levels, I think uh, Jorg was talking about that where you can have, uh, you know, information, debug, warning and stuff there, the multiple levels within the DSC logger that they have or HSC logger that they have. Uh, but then also uh, be nice to your users. I think it was at Steve was saying, yeah, be nice, right? Be considerate of their time because you know that the insights there, you know that Windows, if it, you know, get a blue screen of death, right? What use does that have to you, right? It's like, Ugh. but what if it could go into a thing that actually accelerated your time to insight 
of what that thing was, right? And so think about that extra step, not just getting the information, but how to get to the insights faster. And sometimes that creates a little bit of extra work, but for somebody who's especially making an architecture that has that information available, I know that in uh, DQMH, there's some new stuff that they've got now with uh, like on the fly sequence diagramming that gets done, right? Imagine if you could get that for, for IOTrace. Right. Or imagine if you already had the ability to easily add information to IOTrace about stuff in your program. Right. Then then all of a sudden that could be digested or something that could take uh, a trace and have it actually recreate that portion of the program for you so that you could try to run that again. Right. I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself, but it's it's this idea of like, what do you do about debugging and the information? Yes. Allow the extra amount of information to be there allow it to be user configurable, and then consider trying to make the tools that you want for yourself <laughs> to debug it. Because I can guarantee you when something goes wrong, Steve said it great in his presentation of, you don't want to look dumb and slow in front of a customer when you're debugging. You want to look like a wizard, right? And if they're like, wait, you just, oh my gosh, right? It, that's the kind of those tools and accelerators can make a huge difference. Yeah, exactly. What? Oh, well, look, this gentleman wants to, Jim. Sorry. Hi, Jim. <laughs> I'll just to add to that a little bit. One thing I was thinking of is if you truly have a use case where you have a deluge of information that you need to gather at one time or another, um, one way that's really good to provide a way for users to mine that data is to use something like SQLite. If you're doing like a local SQLite, I don't know what people call it, um, have a local database and there, there are these little files that you mean it's great because you can run a query against it if you're into that sort of thing and you can figure out it, very quickly what's going on with, with the area you're interested in and ignore the rest of the data. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, we we have kind of the same thing. We have, so, so first off is gathering the data. Uh, we do it at the API level. So in, your, in our hardware abstraction labor at the API level, that's where we're gathering the data. But our logger is very flexible. So you can decide at log time what you want to filter by device, by method call, you know, all of these different filters. You can also decide where do you want to filter to, or excuse me, log to. So you can have different logging targets. You can have files, JSON, database, all sorts of things. And then ultimately when you're trying to get the insight from it, then we also have a, a logging console that allows you to do also lots of filtering and stuff, which is something that we'll share as part of our demo, but one more comment. Yeah, I think. you got like five minutes, so. Okay. Forgive me, my solution's very simple. I've been dealing with this more recently and maybe it doesn't work for everybody, but just simply when you have the log in your driver, if you could possibly slow down your timing and synchronize it with everything else, it's easier to find what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The things that we, we do for that is stamp it so that it can be sorted and, and correlated. Not just timestamp, but uh, setting a timing that... Uh, setting a timing that you could coordinate with. Oh, yeah. And that, that reminds me, another plug into our logger is the ability to set the timing. Um, you can set it to PC time or, or some other timing mechanism. So we do exactly that too. Yeah, we abstract that away. Typically it's time string, but if you deal with FPGA or something three steps below, that becomes important. What is your true time source? Maybe it's a DAT clock or whatever. Then it becomes important to synchronize that pixie backplane or whatever across other instruments. So, so before we finish, we wanted to share a little bit of a demo of task, which is the, the UI part, also with in co coordination with our, our HAL. So, I'll let Kevin take this away. Let me just uh, over to the bring side. up a couple other screens because we don't have too much time. But uh, we did talk a lot about a configuration editor. So we can add different devices. Each device might have lots of different settings that you might want to apply or it might not have many. So at this point, we can decide from a DMM what um, device class do we want to use. Right now we've only got two installed, but I think the DC power supply has a couple extras in here. Uh, device class. Yeah, so those are all our actual instruments of other devices. So once I connect to a different one, I can get all the different settings that are required or not required for that individual device, channel, whatever you're trying to configure. So it's very 
out of the box. And this executable is all plugin based, right? All PPLs. I won't have too much time to get into that. This is task. This is um, your baby. Um, a lot of what we use this for, we can take modules, we can undock them and make things independent, move them back wherever we want, we can bring them back, right? Um, or I can just simply close it. Where I wanna start with the how debug. These are all the dynamic different devices that you saw in that list. Um, if we're talking, I think for like a dot, these are all the method calls. It goes and fetches that from the PPL. And you've got all your methods right here. The front panel of that API is shown here. So this list is from the API, may not necessarily be what the device is. So we can decide to show those methods for what your device supports or not. You can run each individual function at this layer, being able to exercise the simulation or the real device. So it's a really cool tool. You can also manage all the devices since there's a device manager in the background to keep track of that. It keeps track of your shared connections. You can decide to close everything from this panel, reinitialize, it makes it real easy. Also all these functions, if you haven't initialized, that is one step that the device will do for you automatically. So if you want to immediately call get reading, it's going to initialize the instrument, fetch some information, and then call get reading. So you don't have to think about that inside when you're trying to automate. So it's a very powerful tool for the how debug. On top of that, since we can also abstract about this different device, we create modes. And this mode is a specific to a DC power supply that can exercise all of those different methods, but at a different UI level. So this might be at a debug level where I can pick a different instrument, hopefully one that doesn't have an error, turn it on, start graphing, and then start interacting with my actual how. Let's see, I think I actually make this go up to 10 or something and I can start exercising those how calls at the UI level. So this is a great way to not only debug when you're actually uh, building the executable or when you're trying to run your instrument, uh, great tool. Um, so we've got a number of these between SMU, switch controller, even have one for a camera, maybe that'll actually work. Hey. <laughs> that was fun. The other thing we have is a log console. So everything that I just exercised, is being logged to file. So I set it up to save to CSV, JSON, text files. I could also save it to TDMS. I could send it off to SQLite, like you said before. Or what's really powerful is what you were trying to get at, Norm, was more about an insight. We only want to keep an insight as to what's currently going on. So this console can do both JSON or tab inside your spreadsheet and be able to look at all of the functions that we just ran. We've got all the different filtering. So if I've got different logs, depending on how I send my messages, whether it's a trace or my errors get logged or I get a fatal, I can decide to filter that based on device name, based on all this information. Or if I want a different trace on the table side, you can easily save this off the file. There's a lot of different things that the, the log console provides that insight during runtime. You can see what's going on and save that off. Another cool feature that we have is part of the how is part of the loggers when you bring it all together. When you're doing a lot of DV testing or trying to build up a framework, you typically don't have the instrumentation. So you can start creating an editor and start recording information like from the how debug. Maybe I want to start getting a reading. I want to start running a DC power. It's actually already running, which means I probably have a lot of information in my record and playback. But if I pause, Everything that I just did got recorded and I could play it back, but that's almost too much. So actually let's go ahead and start a new one. And let's go to the how debug. Did I actually start recording? No, I did not. Just wanna get a little more simplified example for y'all. Let's do some RF stuff. Let's go to a switch controller to pick a device for some RF that we've got, pick a profile for that, load it, try to initialize a power meter. I want to turn it on, maybe go to 915. We can get some RF status. So we've got some things recorded. I can pause it and I can see that everything here got recorded internally uh, to a different file. So I'm going to stop that editor. I can now click on each independent thing. I can see the VI's control panel. I can see the description. I've got the whole UI of everything that was recorded sets up here in the front panel. And it also keeps track of time, if time is important. If it's not, click it all, let's type in zero. I want everything to just rip, roar, and go. 
Or maybe, you know what, I've got a different radio device now. I did this in simulation. I want to change my device to a simulated one. Done. So this recording tool is very powerful to not only record, but also edit. Another cool feature is um, in terms of playback. So if we go to the log console and we clear everything, we can go back to the playback and go ahead and just start a playback and it's done. I can go to my log console, it's all there. Another cool feature, last little bit, is if we go back to the editor, we can export this to CSV for artifacts of what you ran, but you can also create your own test stand file. Uh, I'll just call this gdevcon if I can get that in there. And we'll export this and it's gonna take all of this and actually build a test stand file where we have test stand right here. Let me clear the log console again. Go into test stand. I'm gonna pick that file that just got created. Hit test. It's gonna ask for the typical number. It's gonna step through everything, everything passed. I can hit stop. Log console, everything's here. That's so cool. Right? It's really cool. <laughs> so now that you can take your DV test at your desk in simulation, build up your sequence that you want, record it, fine tune it however you want, export it to test in, and now you can start your automation here, right? Being able to add your own pass fail limits, being able to do different abstraction layers, whatever you want to do. So this is a great tool. What do y'all think? Awesome. <laughs> that wraps it up. So we've sold you all, so we can, we can justify our uh, company expense for sending us here. Um, if you do want to learn more information, you know, hit us up. Um, but, you know, we wanted this to be not just, I mean, obviously this isn't just a sales thing. We wanted to share information and let everybody share with each other. And so thank you for making this a, a success in making this a, a great giant panel discussion. And, and especially to our, our experts that spoke up a lot. We're not putting you down at all. We like that you did speak up. So um, without further ado though, is there any other questions or are we out of time? I think we're out of time. We're out of time, okay. Yeah. Well, if there's any other questions, hit up some of the other experts in the room, hit us up and, and we'll go from there. So thank you. Thank you. A special thanks goes out to Kevin Chirey, Quentin Q. Aldridge, Mark Bala, and Jeff DeVore for their help in filming. And of course, this GDevCon NA 2023 wouldn't be possible without all of our sponsors. Thanks.